Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, we are just about to start uh, the next session. Uh, I am very honored to be a uh, chairman of this session. Actually, during my over 20 years in Center for Theoretical Physics, I didn't have much opportunity to discuss with Professor Danisti, but one discussion I remember very well. Uh, actually, we considered the referee reports in which the referee claimed that gravitational field cannot affect uh, uh, subatomic particles because they are so small. And since then, uh, actually, I teach physics in elementary school and discuss with my students in seventh and eighth grade how it comes that if I throw a tennis ball, it falls down. But this so terribly small and terribly light uh, oxygen molecule also somehow is kept around the Earth. But, for example, it's not kept around the Moon. We have uh, three uh, presentations, three talks. The first by Professor Zonjewski, then by Professor Moskowski, and the third one by Professor Turski, who is not here, but offered uh, a recording of this of his lecture. Uh, Kazimierz Zonjewski, uh, Professor Bialunicki, and the super radiant phase transition. Kazimierz, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, it's a pleasure and honor to, to speak at this symposium. Uh, I'm really a student of Professor Bialunicki. I've got master degree and PhD under his advice and we know each other for over 40 years now. Uh, however, we wrote together only one single paper about the super island phase transition and I decided, just because of this great occasion, to really discuss issues around this paper and this paper this afternoon. I enrolled in physics in 1961. It was our old and much loved Hoja 69. Uh, I can tell you I was a good student. Uh, and I was lucky because most of my teachers were also excellent teachers. Among them, there were two that I would call outstanding. One of them was Andrzej Trautmann, the other was Ivo Białynski Birula. Uh, I helped Trautmann teaching in classical mechanics and introduction to general relativity. And Professor Białynski, that was first course in quantum mechanics, then graduate course in the introduction to quantum field theory, but in between there was the absolutely outstanding and very interesting uh, course on mathematical methods in physics, so-called second semester, more advanced things, uh, really addressed only to future theoreticians. Uh, this course was split into two parts. The second part was the theory of irreducible representation of groups, representations of groups. Beautiful, I would say incredibly beautiful. I, I, I think I still remember quite a lot out of that. But even more incredible was the first part of this course devoted to functional analysis, really devoted to the theory of, of linear operators in human space, spectral theory and so on. Of course, there, I learned something as fundamental as that. Fundamental, but most physicists tend to ignore it, that if you are given an operator, then it is not enough to know how it acts, but you also should know the domain. Yes? Great discovery at that time for me. Then, of course, there was a very strictly explained difference between symmetric operators, self and joint operators, Essentially, self-adjoint operators, etc. Very nice, clear, and precise 
definition of the spectra. Of course, bond, uh, bound state of the discrete spectrum, continuous spectrum, and something, something strange, residual spectrum, that I must say I have forgotten the definition of. Then still these integrals, and finally the spectral theorem. It was really fantastic, something that I really enjoyed attending. Uh, one reason was that in parallel with physics, I also studied mathematics at the time, and I was probably slightly better prepared to enjoy this lecture uh, than most uh, my colleagues. Uh, and what I really liked so much was mathematics explained the way that physicists can appreciate. In contrast to some of the mathematical lectures that I've attended more or less in parallel. As I said, then I, I went through the program of master degree and, and PhD in physics. I, I chose, I asked and was nicely accepted, I asked Professor Bialyniski to be my mentor. As I said, the only uh, competing person would be Professor Troutman. There are many reasons why I chose Bialyniski. Uh, while well, it was quantum mechanics, I was fascinated with quantum mechanics. I wanted to do something with quantum theory. But the other was temperament. These two gentlemen, as most of you know, differ, absolutely differ very much in terms of temperament, especially this 30, 40 or so years ago. They were really very different. And, and somehow this enthusiasm and, and criticism also of, of Ivo Bialyniski was really appealing. It was something that I, I thought, OK, it's great. It's great to have such a mentor. OK, after that, I got PhD, and two, two years have passed. And then, again, with the help of Professor Bialynitsky, I went to the US as a postdoc. And then I, I arrived in Rochester, in upstate New York, in the group of Joe Ebenry. Uh, there was young just getting a PhD, young student late, Krzysztof Gutkiel is there. And then I brought with me remarks almost on the last day before I left from another colleague, Władek Zakowicz. Now, Professor Zakowicz, who is sick and cannot be here, of course, about so called happen lip face transition. OK, that's the uh, title page of that paper. The authors are Klaus Hepp and Eliot Lieb. Eliot Lieb, probably all of you know about, a uh, great American mathematical physicist. Uh, those who work on cold gases, of course, associate his name with this famous Lieb and Linear model, but that's a different uh, paper by Lieb. Uh, the other author is a Swiss guy, Klaus Hepp, uh, also very eminent figure in physics. Uh, one of these exceptional Westerners who were, grad, uh, who were postdocs in Russia with Bogolubov. Uh, also author of important contributions to, to QED. That's another story. Great guy. Uh, soon after this paper has been written, he left physics and became a biologist. Little bit like Daniel Hucci. Alright, so what these guy, guys discovered? They took a well-known toy model of mutually interacting atoms, mutually interacting with a resonant light, called the DT model. So there are two level atoms many of them, coupled to the electromagnetic field so they can emit and absorb single photons. The model has been originally uh, proposed by Dickey and then used by many authors to describe collective de-excitation, collective uh, uh, radiation of many light sources. And they showed, these guys, 
they showed in the paper published in Annals of Physics that actually this system has a phase transition, undergoes a phase transition if the coupling constant is large enough. And coupling constant in principle can be large enough by increasing the density of these atoms. Don't, don't tell me that if you increase this density too much, then you will probably certainly go beyond validity of this model. But these are mathematical physicists, so they did not care about that. <laughs> okay. Now, the paper is long, it's very complicated. I never, never went through all of this, of course, reading conclusions, abstracts, and so on. But fortunately, in the same Rochester, as I arrived in 1975, there, were, there was a guy from Indonesia, Ferg Hyo, who wrote with another guy, Wong, two years before, almost immediately after this paper, something that simplified the derivation and the reasoning very much. Namely, they noticed that this collapsed state with a lot of photons that happen to be found can be described by a C number, by a classical field. In other words, the operator character of A's and the integers, creation and action operators, it's really not essential in this limit, in the limit of, of uh, n going to infinity means in the thermodynamic limit. Now with that, equipped with that, and equipped with the Vladex remark that this is such a strange thing, it cannot happen, uh, with Krzyzek, Vutkiewicz, in Rochester, we did solve the problem uh, disproving the existence of this super and phase transition. Uh, my first equation here is this famous Vicky Hamiltonian. This is what happened if we were using it. And the second thing is really what we would like to start from, namely full minimal coupling, uh, uh, Hamiltonian describing interaction of atoms with light, with a single mode of light. All right, so we, I will briefly tell you how did we prove that this second Hamiltonian has no Dicke phase transition and what is really essential, what should be thrown away to arrive at something that has a phase transition, but this is already described in the title. The A squared term is really what we believe was missing in this first Hamiltonian. I, as I say, I will go to physics, just a little bit, or mathematical physics, just a little bit in, a, in, in a two or three minutes. But let me tell you that, first of all, publishing, three Polish guys publishing the paper in PLL at that time was really a rare thing. There were very, very few papers from Poland published in PLL at the time. Even though with Witkiewicz we had Rochester addressing it, but it was clearly Polish names and so on. And then there were two American guys. Should I mention the name? No, I won't mention the name. Who decided that we were deeply wrong and that there is this heavenly trans uh, phase transition. And they wrote a paper criticizing us, but also doing it in a very impolite way. Probably largely because of this impolite character of the paper. The paper was rejected first by PRL, then by laser physics, uh, uh, British, I don't remember, one of the British journals, and with maybe even third rejection, they decided that they are treated unfairly by the community. It was long before the internet. So what they did, they copied, they made like 100 or so copies of all the letters, their paper, and their, their correspondence with the journals, and they sent it all over the world with a cover letter saying that these French poles, they really took hold of something like purely American physical review letters, and that's a scandal. So we became, you know, like celebrities who are, of course, becoming, who should like it, when there is some kind of a scandal emerging, yes? We were, of course, not celebrities, we were worried 
But nevertheless, the end result was life with celebrities. Namely, a lot of people learned about our existence. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's, the, that's the anecdote. And now a little bit of physics, mathematical physics, as I say. So first, if we start from this minimal coupling Hamiltonian and do all typical uh, maneuvers, uh, getting down to the two-level system, then the Hamil better Dicky Hamiltonian looks like this, with additional term which was missing, of course, in Dicky's papers, that is coming from the A squared term in the minimal coupling. Plus, if you do it like this, then there is also no so-called rotating wave approximation, but that's a minor thing. Uh, happened, it had it in, with, in, with another uh, not only they did not have a square, but also they had rotating wave approximation. But I don't need to explain what it is. Now, if you uh, want to go a little closer, then you check what's the expression for two couplings, lambda and kappa, and then you very quickly you will see that while lambda grows like a square root of a density, then kappa grows linearly. Oops. Kazik, naciskasz na taki wie coś, co ci każe niechcący na to naciskasz. Maybe. I will be more cautious. Okay, so what uh, what shall we do with this? Well, S S I try now to be cautious, yes. Uh, as, as, as typical with such thermodynamic problems, we look at the canonical partition function, quickly do the trace over the uh, atomic variable, which are just two by two matrices, so it's very easy. And then, of course, what we get is this classical field. We are using this Hughes uh, remark on observation. And then we get expression of this sort. And for that, everyone knows that it makes sense to try to use the steepest descent method, look at the saddle points. And the equation for the saddle point looks like this, while eta is expressed in terms of this z, which is the dimensionless amplitude of the electric field. And when you see what happens is, that there would be a phase transition with non-zero z's if this certain point uh, exp uh, equation would have solutions with eta greater than 1, because then we would go to this right formula and would find z and minus z as the solutions, finite, finite amplitudes of electric field in this condensed phase, so to say, of light. However, well, the equation that we want to solve has the hyperbolic tangent on the right, and hyperbolic tangent, as we all know, <laughs> changes between minus 1 and plus 1. So this, this uh, equation could have a solution greater than 1 only if the coefficient multiplying eta is smaller than 1, only if this is so. Yes? Now, I can go back to the original uh, parameters. Yeah, I see the transition dipole moment downstairs, and I see the frequency, uh, transition frequency upstairs, and I also see rho, linear function of, of rho in the numerator and in the denominator. And uh, as you see, uh, for this phase transition to happen, the ratio of something multiplying rho in numerator and the denominator should be smaller than 1. However, there is a classic atomic physics sum rule called Thomas uh, 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 sum rule, which states like this. And with this uh, uh, taken into account, this uh, inequality cannot hold, so that's the end of our rigid proof that found its way. To, to PRL in 1975. I already told you about, about the turmoil it has.
involved, our, our paper arose. I returned to Poland, and then, of course, I joined back the group of Professor Piawinski. And at that time, at that time we were still working on Saturdays, at least half day. And Piawinski yeah, was running some sort of the group meeting of, of, of some kind on Saturday morning. That typically lasted two or three hours. And various students were asked every week to present the latest, what they had done. And then there was a discussion, and Professor Bernisk was explaining why it makes no sense or something. Uh, I mean, really helping. And there were two senior guys sitting next to Professor Bialinski, Krzysztof Gutkiewicz, who just returned with his PhD from Rochester and myself. We were also trying to, to look smart or, or, or behave in a smart way, not always succeeded. And things were really incredibly instructive, productive, illuminating for, I think, every, each of us. At some point, one Saturday morning, I was asked to, to tell what I'm working on. And at that time, I was slowly preparing myself for habilitation. I decided to devote my habilitation to this phase transition. So I was, I've, by that, I, I've written, I think, three more papers trying to extend our initial results to slightly more realistic situations, slightly not going too far, having, for instance, many modes of electromagnetic field, having them not in the same place, and so on. But always to level atoms. And at the time when I was asked to present my, my latest results, I was just working on some really big step, namely, forget about two levels, we know that atoms are much more complicated than an infinite plus the continuous spectrum. So let's look at the problem as, as it is for realistic atoms. And after probably not weeks, but really months of struggle, I was slowly grinding to get this theorem proved by some incredibly complicated way with expansions in terms of coupling constant and so on and so forth. Some, I have invented my own, I remember, diagrammatic technique of, of, of keeping track of all these thousands of terms that I had to deal with. And then Professor Dyarski said, oh, no, 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 it can be done in a simple way. I will show you how. And maybe not right away, but maybe next week, she came, uh, he came to me and really told me what, what we can do, namely that we can prove a no-go theorem. And that's really the paper that we both wrote, the only paper that we wrote together. Uh, I have just a very quick uh, sketch of what we have done. It's a very short paper, I think three pages only. So what we started from is just a copy from the that copy of the paper. What we started from is a Hamiltonian, which is much more general. It contains this, this uh, uh, minimal coupling for both nuclei and electrons. Nuclei have capital R as positions. Electrons have little r as, uh, as positions. And we even go beyond uh, standard non-relativistic p square over 2m. Square, square is this. Uh, that must have been missing in the paper. <laughs> because that's a copy. Which square is missing? Square P minus EA. Oh, no, no, no. Look, you, you overlook. It's, I'm just saying, it's arbitrary function of this. Ah. That, we were clever. I mean, you were clever. Okay, okay. <laughs> it could be real, real, relativistic or whatever, yes? Sure. Or maybe some future theory. Provided it couples to electromagnetic field by minimal coupling. 
Okay, so that was our starting point. We are still having only one mode of the electromagnetic field, but, but atoms are just a collection of positive charged nuclei and negative charged electrons. Uh, and with that, what we have done, well, we introduced a unitary transformation of the kind that is in here. This unitary transformation can be simplified if we assume dipole approximation, if we assume that electrons are very close to the nuclei, uh, so close that the distance is much smaller than the wavelength of this, of this uh, uh, radiation that we are accounting for. So the next stage is, of course, this, this approximation, uh, dipole approximation. And equipped with this, one can easily check what happens. One can easily check that actually our Hamiltonian is unitarily related to something with field completely eliminated. It's called no goal theorem. It has a lot of citations, about 200. And it is still quoted, as I said. Why? I mean that again. I'm sure this paper was also the, the uh, part of my habilitation. Uh, I have done one more step generalizing this Nogu theorem. Together with Krzysztof Gawensky, we were able to really go one more step further, namely eliminate need for dipole approximation. So we had all multiples. And for that, we used what is called the diamagnetic inequalities from field theory. Paper is more mathematical, so it has very few citations. But it's stronger. The result is stronger than, than our result. As I say, I got habilitation. There were three reviewers. One of them was lukewarm but positive. I, I will not disclose his name because he has written a paper afterwards criticizing us, saying that there is, of course, space transition. Together with the law and Hammond, we proved him wrong. We were over done with another paper. So things are lovely, the, uh, lively. The other reviewer was late, uh, Andrei Kosakowski. He was very positive. And the third one is sitting here was Jarek Piasenski, who was also positive. Otherwise, I would not mention his name. <laughs> uh, OK, and at the end of this process of getting habilitation, I spoke with Lukasz, Lukasz Turski. And Lukasz said, oh, it's very nice. I really like this, this stream of stronger and stronger results. But you know what, Kazik? One day, some clever experimentalist will actually produce the superadient phase transition. I took it as a joke. But in 2010, Tilman Lessinger at ETH Zurich performed an experiment which was actually demonstrating the original happen lip phase transition. But of course, not proving us wrong but rather finding the way for this sort of Hamiltonian in a completely different area of physics, in cold atoms physics. As I say, that has happened in 2010. And that's a nature paper of Esslinger and his students. And here is what he did. So imagine that we've got a DEC, means condensate, this, this, this dark spot in the middle, which is squeezed to almost a plane by some magnetic trap. And imagine that we are sending light from below, and there is a mirror above, so the standing wave is being formed. If the intensity of this laser light is not very strong, that's all there is to it. 
However, if I pump the intensity higher, above certain threshold, then something interesting happens, the phase transition occurs, namely, there is a, I, I didn't tell you, uh, here on the left and right, there are two mirrors of the very good quality cavity. And this cavity has a mode which is nearly resonant with, uh, with something, with the internal transition in the atom. That would quickly contradict our theorem. It's nearly resonant with the difference of energy between the atomic center of mass atomic wave function, which is spread all over this, this, this droplet in the middle, and, uh, and the state that would be produced if one photon from the laser beam is absorbed and then one photon to the cavity mode is emitted. If so, then some kind of the lattice has, is appearing, and that's already the phase transition. And if you look closer, that's the situation. Actually, atoms jump from this delocalized state to also delocalized state, which is spread all over this lattice, but it can do it in two different ways. I'm almost done. Uh, two minutes? OK. Uh, OK, so uh, if you think of Hamiltonian, which we describe it, it's awfully complicated. Of course, there are sines and cosines that are representing the standing waves. There are two standing waves appearing. But if you go then to the second quantization, then you actually end up with a Dicky Ham uh, Hamiltonian. With all, of course, J is the sum of the sigmas of this single atom uh, uh, two level type operators. It's not the end. If you look closer into the paper, there is also something which looks almost like the A squared term. But this time, this pseudo A squared term is not killing the transition. Because as you can see, it is proportional to the number of atoms that jumped to the, to the lattice and photons that are there. Of course, to the left of the, of, the, of the transition, this is exactly equal to zero. And to the right, it is at the first time tiny. So this term is not killing the phase transition. And actually, the superadded phase transition got a new life with this seminal experiment of Tillman Essinger. Now, of course, it's time to, to say many happy returns of the day. And I really enjoyed this 40 or so years of our acquaintance. Thank you. Thank you. We have question, uh, time for one question or comment. Please. I didn't quite understand at the beginning. You said it's the A squared term that was omitted. Yes, in Dickey Hamiltonian. In the Dickey Hamiltonian. Right. And if you add the A squared term, do you there get There is no phase transition. There's still no phase transition. No, 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 not still. Without A squared, there is. With A squared, there isn't. Ah, OK, because you can make the gate transformation. Right? That's yes. Actually, the fact that the gauge transformation can eliminate the field is apparent only if you do not make to level atom approximation. It was only apparent, uh, obvious in the uh, formulation that we get with Plesso uh, Yeah. No, and the, at the happen mid -time, uh, times, it was of course not, because the two level atom is somehow, uh, does not seem to have a lot to do with uh, minimal coupling. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Please. Mm -hmm. I have a question. What's happened after 2010 with this story? Oh, there's if a all, lot of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very good question. Thank you very much. There is a lot of experiments along similar lines making things more complicated and sometimes more interesting, like having more phases and stuff. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I was on the panel at DFG on some big proposal. I will not tell you who or where experiments are being planned. And one of the groups was actually planning another set of experiments 
with the phase transition of that kind. So it's very much alike. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if there, is, there are no more questions, then let's thank again the speaker.